Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Dan here at Rexmont Church in Rexmont, Pennsylvania, the southern end of beautiful Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. We are uh, continuing in our sermon series on the Minor Prophets. Now, a lot of people think that the minor prophets, the, the prophet's job was to predict the future, tell us what's going to happen in the future. And, and while they did a lot of that, that really wasn't the primary purpose of a, a prophet. The primary purpose of a prophet was to show us the character of God. Kind of like a, a diamond with has all kinds of different faces on it. And each of the prophet's job was to was to describe for us one of the faces of God, one of the facets of God's character. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the prophet uh, Nahum. And uh, Nahum's job, his the characteristic that of God that he was going to is going to uh, present to us is is God's anger. We don't like to think about God being angry. Uh, in fact, I don't think there's a characteristic that more people ignore today as that of the anger of God. We don't want to offend people. And so we try to pass God off as a kindly gentleman who can't bear the thought of punishing anyone or judging anyone. We often want to people to think of God as if he had a, a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. We, we want to, to tell people that God is Santa Claus. He looks like him and he acts like him. Many Christians and, and many pastors would like to forget that God can and does get angry. And it was Nahum's task to unfold for us the anger of God. In Nahum's book, God flashes forth in, in fury, a God who, before whom we must stand silent and trembling. We cannot read the book of Nahum without sensing something of the seriousness of this picture of, of God. And, and Nahum gets to do it as a sequel to another minor prophet we've already looked at. Hollywood has learned the uh, value of sequels in the movie industry. In fact, uh, many Hollywood actors nowadays, when they sign a contract and agree to be in a movie, uh, a lot of times there's a clause in their contract that says you are signing up to do at least three movies so that they can do uh, two sequels after it. Unless, of course, you're in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, in which case uh, Robert Downey Jr. playing Tony Stark uh, has signed up for at least 12 movies, as well as a number of TV series as well. Book publishers will often encourage writers to, to create a sequel, uh, a follow-up to a bestseller. And the book of Nahum is is the sequel uh, sort of i guess to the book of jonah and maybe nahum could be called uh, jonah 2 the return of the fish <laughs> or or something like that i don't know uh, as we begin this book it's important to know why and at whom god is so angry uh, the, this prophecy that Nahum gives is directed against the city of Nineveh, to whom God had sent the prophet Jonah. When Jonah preached in Nineveh, the city repented in sackcloth and ashes. God's anger was withheld from the city, and he spared it, because from the king on down to the lowest citizen, they turned to God and repented of their sins. The book of Nahum occurs about a hundred years after the prophecy of Jonah. During this hundred year time period, children and grandchildren were born. New kings ascended the Assyrian Empire's throne. 
And can you guess what happened? That repentance, <laughs> they repented of it. <laughs> they, they turned around on their turnaround. The, the time of sorrow over evil became a, a, a hiccup in their legacy of oppression and brutality. Their cruelty increased. They once again sought to capture, torture, and enslave other nations. Nineveh had repented of its repentance and had begun to do the very same violence again that called forth the threat of judgment through the prophet Jonah the first time. King Shanacharib, who came from the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh, invaded Israel during the time of the prophet Isaiah. And it was from this city in the north that the armies of the Assyrians frequently came against the lands of Judah and Israel. In 722 BC, the Assyrian army, led by King Shalamanzer, and after his death by Sargon and Shanacharib, uh, defeated the northern kingdom of Israel with its capital at Samaria and, and spent almost 20 years destroying every town and city in the nation of, of Israel before, before Shanacharib decided to, to head south into conflict against the kingdom of Judah with its capital at Jerusalem. But God moved to protect his people and meet and destroy these enemies of the Shanacharib, uh, of Shanacharib overnight. We talked a little bit about this uh, on our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, so if you did not get a chance to watch that, I encourage you to go to YouTube and find the video and um, go ahead and watch that. Um, if you if you don't listen up, this is pretty cool. Um, Shanacharib's army is surrounding the city of Jerusalem, laid siege to it. Second Kings chapter eighteen tells us that with the Assyrian army surrounding the city, King Hezekiah, a good king of Israel, uh, of Judah, asked the prophet Isaiah to intercede on uh, with God on the city's behalf. Then, in addition to Isaiah going to God, Hezekiah himself goes to the temple to pray. And 2 Kings 18, 17 through 19 says, It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Hezekiah isn't interested in saving his own life or his own reputation. He isn't trying to puff himself up or, or put his opponents down. His goal as a leader of his country is to see God glorified among the nations of the world so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. I'd vote for Hezekiah for president of the U.S. I mean, you know, if he hadn't died 2,700 years ago. But in today's political climate, uh, that's just a minor inconvenience. God sends a message through Isaiah to Hezekiah and the nations that, uh, that Shanachar will not defeat Jerusalem. 2 Kings 18, 35 and 36 says, That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and he stayed there. And then Nineveh comes along with a, a prophecy, not against the nation of Judah, but against the Assyrians. Uh, some time had passed, and 
uh, the the Assyrians, even though that God had protected the nation of Judah, the Assyrians began to cause problems again for them. Unlike Jonah, who, who was sent to the city of Nineveh to get them re to repent, Nahum was sent to minister to the southern kingdom of Judah about 30 years after Isaiah and the invasion of the Assyrian king Shennacherib into Judah. Nahum prophesied the righteous anger of God being poured out against the Assyrian nation because of their sins. There are a lot of Bible prophecies uh, that, that, that remain to be fulfilled. Quite a few of the predictions in the Old Testament prophets look even beyond our own day uh, to a time when Jesus will come again. But as we look at the book of Nahum, we see prophecies that have already been fulfilled. And that I think this is one of the great proofs of the Bible, that the Bible is from God, because there's a description in Nahum of exactly how the destruction of Nineveh would occur, given years before that destruction actually took place. In those days of trouble, God sent Nahum with a divine message of judgment for Nineveh. His words provide us with, I think, some great understanding of God's character. The book begins <clears throat> a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkasite, Nahum 1.1. 1, 1. The book's author is Nahum, and his name means comfort. And I think this is appropriate because his message of the coming judgment on Nineveh comforts Judah after their suffering at Assyria's hand. It's not a comfort for Assyria. It is for Judah. You can imagine how comforting it was when the Assyrian army was there and their reputation as ruthless warriors burning and destroying and raping and pillaging and killing the women and children and sparing no one to have a prophet stand up in Jerusalem and declare to them that God would destroy their enemies, Nineveh, the capital city. Uh, about 35 years ago, when the, the country of Romania was still under communist rule, uh, there was a Christian pastor who, who, who commented on the book of Revelation. He said it was the favorite book of the Romanian church. They loved the book of, Rome, of Revelation because it was written by the Apostle John, the pastor of the church, who, while he was in exile, and Romanian Christians knew what it was to be in exile and to be imprisoned. They suffered as the early Christians had suffered. They desperately uh, were, were abused and subjected to cruelty. They, and when they read the book of Revelation, they heard the clear message that God is God and he judges the good and the bad. He is personally committed to seeing that evil does not triumph. This, said the pastor, is very different from how North American Christians look at the book of Revelation. We're fascinated with the historical details, trying to work out precise future plans and speculations. We wonder about rapture and, and hope we will never have to suffer. The Rome, Romanian Christians, he said, suffered and in that suffering, heard God speaking to them through the Apostle John. The way the Romanians looked at the book of Revelation is how the Jewish nation heard the book of Nahum, the prophet Nahum. It was a message of comfort in the midst of their suffering, a, a word of hope in a dark time of evil, a message that all is not lost and God maintains final control. It's probably a good message for us today as well. I think it should do us good to be reminded that God is still God. He has the final word on pain and injustice and abuse and unfairness. When we think evil and wicked people win while good and decent people are punished, I think it's best not to complete the scorecard until the final whistle is blown. Don't count your chickens before they hatch is a quite popular expression. 
at that point when the whistle is blown the the fat lady sings as we used to say at that point god will make the correct judgment call the wicked will be punished and the righteous will be rewarded and that knowledge should give us comfort nahum's prophecy was directed towards Nineveh. They had returned to their wicked and evil ways and were treating nations as objects of commerce to be bought and sold and then discarded when they lost their value. Nahum spoke his message in the form of an oracle or divine word that pronounced judgment on the nation of Assyria. And, and I think the to to sum up the book of Nahum, of Nahum we, we need to look to chapter 2. Nahum chapter 2, verse 13. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. Some of the most chilling words in the entire Bible. I am against you declares the Lord Almighty. Who would want God against them? What a frightful prospect. Not merely left to wander around in our own resources, but having the God of creation, the God of angel armies, actively opposing you. If God is against you, what does it matter who is for us? Now, the Lord Almighty here refer, is referring to the, the power of God and, and appears often in the Old Testament in military context. Um, uh, the Lord of Angel Armies that, that I mentioned is another phrase that is often used, translated Lord Almighty. When this particular verse talks about chariots and, and lions and, and, and prey and, and, and messengers, it's referring to the strength of the Assyrians. The Lord himself intends to reduce Nineveh's strength to rubbish. And the evidence of the coming end of Nineveh due to God's judgment are written in this one verse. Nineveh's chariots will be burned. The sword will devour its soldiers. No spoils of war will be brought back to Nineveh. And the voice of its messengers will be stilled. God would have the final word. He will defeat, destroy, and annihilate Nineveh. Not long after this particular um, prophet, Nahum, prophesies against Assyria, the Babylonian army overwhelmed and destroyed Nineveh. Nahum provided a peek at how the defeat would take place in Nahum chapter 2, verse 6. He says, the river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses. According to the Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, Babylon, Babylon laid siege to Nineveh, and that year there were extraordinarily heavy rains, and the river that runs through the, the city of Nineveh overflowed, and it flooded the city, and it collapsed a large section of the wall. The king of Nineveh figured out all was lost, and so he collected all his wealth, his concubines, his eunuchs, his servants, and, and he took them all into the palace, and he, he set fire to the palace, killing everyone inside, including himself. And the Babylonians, when they entered where the water had breached the walls and took the city. In other words, they came through the river gates to discover the palace in flames before it collapsed. Exactly as Nahum had said. Nahum had prophesied these events. His message of judgment came true exactly as God had told him it would. You know, that message of judgment is often one that we would rather not discuss. Our belief system would rather exclude punishment for wrong when it comes to our own sins. We're not a people that like to think about account accountability or, or even worse, retribution. We would rather not believe that there are consequences for our actions. We think we can go on our way, avoiding any reprisal for wrong. But Nahum tells us we should know differently. 
granted the idea of judgment does not fit with the picture that maybe we want of a loving God. And in fact, it, it stretches our minds to envision a God of justice and judgment. Somehow the that idea does not mesh with our concept of the goodness of God. But the fact is that God brings judgment as part of his goodness. How could a good God allow, continue to allow evil to exist? How could a loving God not punish the evildoer? Modern uh, society will say, yes, you can't. A good God wouldn't allow evil to exist, so therefore he's not good. And we as Christians say, yes, a good God cannot allow evil to exist, and so he will punish the evildoer. One commentator uh, on this particular passage wrote, his judgment is an inevitable expression of his goodness on behalf of the victims of evil. Someone once said, if you cannot get angry when you hear or see injury and injustice, it is proof that you are not capable of love. For the one who cannot be angry is the one who cannot love. If you can read stories of atrocities and oppression and that awful traffic in body-destroying and soul-destroying drugs and narcotics among young people and never be moved to burning anger, then I tell you there is something wrong with you. We often, as humans, execute our judgment out of hate. God executes his judgment out of his love. We become livid when we read that another child has been raped or another innocent victim has been murdered. We feel the need for retribution, for God to sit idly by and never deal with those issues would give us great cause for concern. God is not amoral. He is loving, but he is also just. And in loving justice, he will wield judgment over his creation. Many people are uncomfortable with God's role as the judge. They, we prefer a meek and mild savior. They want love and forgiveness, but not accountability and judgment. In the Bible, we have a clear picture that Jesus, the one who was slain for our sins, will be the one executing judgment on our sin. God, in the person of Jesus Christ, is the only one qualified to be both Savior and judge. There's a, a story about a teenage pedestrian walking along the street. He doesn't see an oncoming truck uh, as he crossed a, a busy boulevard in, oh, I don't know, New York City, Philadelphia. Just before the young man darted in front of the speeding vehicle, a strong hand grabbed his shirt and pulled him back safely to the curb and red with fear and adrenaline, the teen thanks this elderly man for saving him. But several weeks later, the same teenager is now in court, standing trial for, for uh, stealing a car. When the boy looks up at the judge, he recognizes him. Hey, you're that man who saved me a few weeks back when the truck was coming, explained the young man. Surely you can do something now. Sorry, son, replied the magistrate. On that day, I was your savior. Today, I am your judge. You know, all people have the opportunity to repent and experience the benefit of salvation, just as the Ninevites had that opportunity when Jonah preached. In fact, Jesus longs for all people to come to repentance. But when we stand before God, the judge, that opportunity is gone. At that time, judgment will be executed. No one can be grandfathered into the faith. Our faith is our own. We're not Christians because our parents were Christians or our grandparents were Christians. I trace my family line uh, back to the Mayflower, to William Brewster, who was the chaplain on the Mayflower. But the fact that William Brewster was a was a Christian and a pastor does not make me a Christian. 
Our faith is our own. We must cling to it, not what the generation before did. We must personally accept the invitation to come to God, to the God of salvation. For when we stand before God, the God of judgment, it will be too late. We do have a way of avoiding God's judgment. Jesus bore the same wrath of God that Nineveh bore. But Jesus took the wrath that we deserve so that we could be spared. The same way Nineveh was spared when her people repented the first time. Jesus took God's judgment on the cross. All of our wicked and vile sins were nailed there with him. He alone is our savior. We need to turn to him, trust him, and follow him. Nahum serves as a warning, driving us to the cross of Jesus. For there we see God's perfect combination of love and justice. His his poor, he, he poured out his wrath. God poured out his wrath against sin on Jesus. His love is shown in Jesus' willingness to die for our sins, receiving, receiving the punishment so that we could be set free. All we need to do is go to Jesus, repenting of our sins, trusting in his free gift of salvation. Not for a moment or for a season like the Assyrians did, but fully and forever. Judgment is coming. Turn to Jesus before it's too late.